Thank you. Good evening, everyone. As they're coming in to join us, I don't know how much of a group we'll have tonight, but hopefully some folks that are interested. It'll take me a couple minutes if you don't mind, I'll read this. Sure, please do. Uh, good evening. Tonight's uh, meeting is being held in compliance with Governor Newsom's Executive Order N2520 in response to the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. The district will conduct the Board, Board of Education's regular meeting as a teleconference. Please use the following toll-free number and meeting ID to call into the meeting. Telephone 669900-9128. Meeting ID 813-5990-9620. Password 438844 or on a computer using the Zoom link that's on our website with the password of 438844. A new process that we instituted tonight, uh, we believe that uh, it'll contribute to additional, uh, to, to folks being able to participate in our meeting a little differently. Um, and that is they can, they can now call in. So public comments can be submitted prior to 5 p.m. Although tonight we, we left it open until uh, seven because of uh, the change in, in process on the day of the board meeting by completing the appropriate submission form at our website tusd.org slash boe slash board hyphen meetings and it's also under our quick links section participants must be logged into the meeting via the zoom link published above or by dialing in your zoom participant name or phone number must match the name on or phone number entered on the Zoom form that you may have submitted so that you can be accurately identified. The guidelines for public comment will be in accordance with board policy 2350, which includes that complaints against students or employees will normally be held in closed session per our policy. Any individual uh, with a disability who requires reasonable accommodations to participate may request assistance by contacting my office at 310-972-6001. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stowe. Um, I do want to go ahead and read on this first page of our agenda, our mission statement, just to remind us why we're all here and what we're doing. Torrance Unified School District strives to ensure that each and every student is educated and prepared to succeed in life. We are dedicated to maximizing individual potential and developing lifelong learners who will be contributing members in a global society. So uh, thanks for everyone for joining us. We are here in open session. We did not have a closed session this, this evening, um, but I do wanna call this meeting to order. We're a little bit late. Oh, and Mrs. Lewis joined us, good. I thought if we uh, postponed a little, we would catch her and here she is. Yes, so I welcome. Had trouble connecting, so. Yes. We, and I texted you also. Yes, you did. And, and we passed the message along. And so hopefully, did, did they help you, I hope, to get in? Uh, I kind of. I okay. actually try to turn off my computer and reboot, so. Okay. We have been having some connectivity things, yeah, this evening for some reason, which is unusual, but, but it does happen. So let's go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I do want to have us do that. If everyone will stand and, <clears throat> and I will go ahead and, and do the pledge. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Another sort of reminder of what we're all doing here for the, uh, for the evening and for students of Torrance. So let me plug in again here. I do, will begin with the oops, adoption of the agenda. So I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for the September 21st regular meeting of the Board of Education. Can I get a motion and a second? So moved. And then was that a second, Mr. Lee? Sure. Okay. 
<laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, we, do, we have no report of closed session this evening, but we do have some staff presentations and some information. And the first of those is a report from the Torrance Council of PTAs. And Mrs. Denise, Denise Spellman has joined us, who is the current president of the Torrance Council of PTAs. So let's see, can, yep, you're unmuted, Denise, go ahead. Good evening, thank you, President Reagans, board members, Dr. Stone, many of our district admin. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, the reason why I'm speaking tonight is, as you know, in the beginning of the school year, our units have membership drives. And membership is vital for PTAs to survive and be able to do good things they do at our school sites. It is also vital to be able to advocate at the state and national levels. Of course, it's not lost on anyone that this year, our school is not starting out the way as it usually does. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has affected PTA as well. Our PTAs have had to get creative and think out of the box to bring in memberships. Most have set up online membership programs to give parents several opportunities and ways to join. This will be a challenging year, but I know our units will rise to the challenge. We have emailed many invitations to our dignitaries, to our board members, to our district. Parents have also received emails um, from their PTAs or have attended meetings, just letting them know the several options to join. Some of you may have already joined and we thank you very much for your continued support of PTA, but we ask that you please take a few minutes to join one or more of our unit PTAs if you haven't already done so. You can also go to the Torrance Council of PTAs website, click where it says join PTA or PTSA. You can see all the 30 schools on how to join. You are also more than welcome to email our membership chair, Michelle Van Lerberge at tcptamembers at gmail.com. And of course, if you have any questions, you can also email me. And again, Torrance Council of PTAs always appreciates your support and dedication to our students at Torrance Unified School District. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions or comments for uh, Denise? Um, I did want to mention that on our agenda tonight, there is a PTA membership enrollment month's resolution um, that says that September and October are both months when you hopefully are thinking about enrolling in PTA membership and uh, participating with that important organization. So we will make sure you get a copy of that, um, Denise, to share with the uh, Torrance Council. And, and did you have anything else that you needed to share about what council's doing or what's happening? Right um, and just real quick, because I know you have a lot on the agenda. Um, Torrance Council PTA packed about approximately almost 400 backpacks full of supplies for our students for our Project FOSS, which stands for bringing our student supplies. Unfortunately, with COVID, a lot of our donation drives did not happen as we wanted to. So supplies were limited, but we just had enough for our families that needed the supplies. And also with Project HOPE, we are getting ready to pack um, care packages for our families, foods and essential needs. So we collect donations throughout the whole school year. So we're always looking for donations of um, non-perishable food as well as personal care items like toothpaste, deodorant, all that stuff. So that's something that we're also doing right now. And with again, with COVID and a lot of the families having to be more at home and not being able to probably work anymore like before, um, we're gonna actually have more of those items out on a more of a regular basis than in our quarterly um, fashion that we normally have. But again, we always welcome donations. We appreciate everybody's continued support for our programs, for BOSS, for Project HOPE, and for everything that you do to support PTA because without your membership, we would not be able to have the programs that we do have for our families and for the students. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Keep you. The good work, night. Torrance Council. Thank you. thank you. I don't think the angels are playing tonight though. They did earlier. We won. Okay. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Packers won too. Go Pack Go. <laughs> oh, and Packers. Okay, I forgot that. All right. Thank you very much. And our next staff presentation is the introduction of our student representative to the board for the first quarter of 2021. 
and a report by that student representative. So to get us started on that, I will call on Dr. Egan. Thank you, Mrs. Reggins. Good evening, members of the board. It's my pleasure to introduce our student representative, Jeffrey Young, uh, the current ASP president at West High School. Jeffrey has served as class president at West High since his freshman year. He's a two-year member and the vice president of National Honor Society, a four-year member and the president of West High's Key Club, as well as an executive assistant for the Key Club Division 19 South, a four-year member of CSF, a member of Torrance Youth Council, four-year member and chairperson of Torrance's Attic Advisory Committee, and was selected last year to represent West High School for Boys State 2020. Jeffrey is also a four-year varsity tennis player and serves as the team captain this year. In his free time, he likes to work with computers, play tennis, and work on new projects of any kind. Jeffrey plans to study electrical engineering and computer sciences at a four-year university in the near future. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Um, what, Egan. What do you have to share about what's going on over at West for us? Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hello, TSD School Board. Um, as you know, over the past month, students at West have been settling into much different circumstances than we are accustomed to. Uh, we had our socially distanced registration um, the 18th and the 19th uh, and began school on the 26th of August with a new distance learning block schedule. There's certainly been a lot of complications, uh, but also there's been a chance for a lot of students to get creative and take initiative at home. So ASP in particular is working hard to create events and activities to take initiative um, and keep the students engaged. And these events include the Welcome Back Assembly on the 25th of September, in which students will be introduced to ASB and get a closer look at the student life, uh, whether that be fine arts, athletics, etc. cetera. Um, ASB is also holding a club rush event all week, the week of the 28th, featuring a different genre of club each day. And in lieu of the homecoming dance that we would normally have this fall, we will be instead hosting homecoming court voting virtually. And while we, while we would all love to uh, be in person for these events, the students are figuring out ways to shift their normal activities online. And in general, it feels as if West High body is adjusting well to the changes and making the best of it. All right, that's all, that all sounds great. Um, have you guys done anything about, uh, or done any thinking about uh, voter registration or the upcoming uh, November election? Is there any talk about that at this point? Um, I think in the ASB scope, uh, there hasn't been much talk about it, but that's something I could definitely bring up at an ASP meeting, for example, but um, in general, I know that there's certainly been students who have been working on uh, infographics and such for voter registration. Okay. Any questions, comments from uh, any of our school board members or anybody? Okay. Well, welcome. We, you will have access to the agenda in advance of the meetings, and I hope you will take advantage of uh, having that access to check it out. And if there are any issues that you want to discuss in the body of the meeting, let us know. Um, if I don't notice you, have somebody else say, hey, Jeffrey wants to say something. Okay, so thanks for being with us. We appreciate your uh, involvement in you all ways. Since, since you started high school, my goodness, you've been a very busy guy. <laughs> all right, so we will move on to our public hearing discussion action items. The first of those is item 9.1, which is a notice of public hearing regarding public input pertaining to the draft maps of district-based boundaries for school board members. This is a duly noticed public hearing for public input pertaining to the draft maps or district-based boundaries for school board members and the sequence of elections. The district held two initial hearings prior to the drafting of potential trustee area election boundaries. Information regarding the previous public hearings and presentations were made available on the district website. This is the second of two hearings on the draft maps prior to selection of a final map and sequence of elections. After the selection, the final map and sequence of elections will be forwarded to the Los Angeles County Committee on School District Organization for review. The County Committee will hold an additional public hearing, which will be held at a time and location to be determined. Dr. Douglas Johnson, oh, there he is, okay. Uh, the President of National Demographics Corporation has been retained to assist the district with preparing the draft maps and sequence of elections. 
Dr. Johnson will provide the public with information underlying each of the draft maps. Hi, Dr. Johnson, welcome again. Thank you and uh, good evening. It's good to be back with you again. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. There we go, excellent. So um, just as I just mentioned, this is the uh, fourth of a, of a series of hearings. Um, and this is the hearing at which we're planning at least that the board will select a map. Uh, this process started back in July and curiously, this is an unusual process in that the board's decision is not the final decision. Um, after the board selects a map and election sequence, then we move to a hearing held by the what's called the Los Angeles County Committee on School District Organization. So they will hold a hearing and they give final approval on uh, the map and the transition. I do want to emphasize, as we have at the earlier hearings, that, that because of the timing and how close we are to the election, this map is not being adopted for this year's election. This year's election will continue to be district-wide where everyone's voting for the open seats. The tr by trustee area elections will kick in for the 2022 election and then continue forward from there. Related to that, of course, hopefully everyone's aware that we are uh, in, in the middle of or close to the end of the 2020 census. So there may have to be some adjustments to these lines following the release of that data but we do anticipate that the map adopted tonight will is likely to be used as the base and those changes will be relatively minor compared to the drawing from scratch we've been through this time. So with those precedents and, and uh, information to go on, I'll go through the maps. Um, as was also noted, we did have an initial discussion last time of the first four draft maps. And let me just very briefly touch on the two that were not the preferred maps, just for people who may not have been around that time. Um, the first map we looked at was map 101. This was based on sort of following council districts as much as we could, but of course there are six council districts, only five trustee areas, and the territory doesn't quite match up. So we did look at this map last time, but there wasn't a lot of interest in it. Uh, similarly, we looked at map 104 last time. This was very much based on kind of to the degree possible, basing each trustee in a given high school attendance zone. You can see the proposed map is the color shadings and the high school attendance zones are the dashed lines. But there was definitely more interest last time amongst the board in two maps that actually tried to blend trustees with trustee areas so that each board member would uh, represent to the degree possible multiple high school areas and wouldn't feel like they represent a given school and only that school. Similarly, um, 102 and 103 would put, would have multiple trustees coming into each uh, high school attendance zone so that when the West PTA got together, they would know that there's representatives from A, from B, and from E who all are, are repre representing voters from that attendance zone and so on. So first we looked at 102. Um, which to the degree possible tries to put each um, put three trustees into each high school attendance zone. I couldn't do it in the north. So in the north you see just A and C cover north high school. But for the other three high schools, you can see they each get three trustee areas touching them. Um, that does, to do that, it does require some odd shapes where E and, and D have to kind of wrap around each other. Um, I do want to highlight that is because of this goal, it's not for any board member. There's no board members that live in there. This is simply trying, the only way to get D into uh, Torrance is to bring it up that way and doing this large connections and large accountability um, for each of the areas meant bringing E well into the South High School area. So that one and 103 had the similar idea, but 103 instead of stretching to go for three uh, board members in each, trust, in each high school attendance zone, just has two. Uh, it's worth noting that West, just because of the population balancing requirements, does end up with a piece of A, a piece of E, and a piece of B. But all the other high schools have two uh, trustee areas representing them. The only hitch that was discussed in the, that came up in the public comments last time is in this map, each trustee area also crosses into two high school 
attendance zones, except for D, because South is so big uh, and the geography of the district, D ends up just in South in this map. So we had two requests and I have two new maps to touch on tonight. The first is 103B. Uh, this is a tiny change. And actually if I highlight, if I overlay the two maps at once, you can see the dark colors mean there's no change. So A, C, and E are the exact same in 103 and B. The only change is down here. Uh, 103B moves south, the campus of H South High School into D. That's the only change. There are no people moving. Um, if you zoom in, you actually see it moves just the high school into D. So that's 103B. All the people are the same as in 103. It's just South High School moves into the trustee area that mostly represents um, South High School's territory. Then based on that discussion about uh, trustee area D being the only one that's only in one high school zone, I did look at whether it was easier to, whether there was a way to get D into a second high school zone without the unusual shapes and odd look of, of map 102. And this is definitely better looking than 102. I leave it up to the board to decide if this is something you want to go for. It, it works fairly compactly. D crosses over into E. It's only really a symbolic crossing. Um, what it goes across to is, uh, let me check my notes to make sure I get it right. Yeah, it, it brings D up to uh, 232nd Street here. So it's about 2,000 people, about 1,200 registered voters in this area. Not a ton for a whole 10 zone, but it would give a, a symbolic vote. Of course, for everything we switch, we have to population balance. So the other change is that E comes in to South High School a little bit. It just comes over to Hawthorne and goes down to 232nd. So everything north of, two, I'm sorry, 230th. Everything north of 230th and east of Hawthorne, uh, that corner, it's again about 2,000 people would move into trustee area E. So all these maps are, are up, they've all been posted, so you can adopt or select whichever one you wish. Uh, but I did want to highlight, uh, based on the last discussion, there was a lot of discussion 103, just a slight change to bring that to 103B that's just moving to high school. And then 103C is the larger transition for you to consider uh, bringing D up into Torrance High. I should note, um, thanks to Spencer Cobert's sharp eye, if you looked at the PDF map that's in the packet, the text on the map says, brings D into Torrance Unified. <laughs> of course, oh. I meant to write, brings <laughs> D into high school. <laughs> My apologies for that, and thank you, Spencer, for catching that. Um, but yeah, so that would give D South and Torrance High. But we are, in so doing, it does a kind of split through a neighborhood. So that's up to the board to decide which way uh, makes more sense there. Mm. Um, with that, just very briefly, there are the equal population requirements, the Federal Voter Rights Act requirements, and then the traditional criteria that we've talked about a lot. All of these maps uh, comply with all those requirements and they're fine to adopt. They just do it, each one does it in a different way. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, as you go through this discussion. Okay, and I, can, Dr. I, I will stop sharing for your discussion, but I can bring this map up at any time if you need it. Okay. Um, thank you for your remarks, Dr. Johnson. Uh, any questions for Dr. Johnson from any of the board members? No, none. Wow, you must have done a really good job this time. <laughs> Not even you, Mr. Lee. I was going to wait for maybe the people who are going to have to run in these districts to talk about them. Oh, ah. well, are there any of you that want to, anyone that wants to talk about that at all at this point? Um, I did want to say, by the way, that um, these are only voting areas that we're talking about. This has no bearing on, on changing attendance areas or changing lines of attendance for any school. I actually got a question about that this weekend and I just wanted to be really emphatic about that. Can you emphasize that, Dr. Johnson? Yes, definitely. I probably should have mentioned that in my presentation because yes, you are right. The moment you start moving attendance lines, it gets much more controversial. This, these lines really only matter officially on election day and that's it. Okay, thank um, you for doing that. 
because no one really wants to say anything. I, I'm kind of a fan of the original 103 with the little notch in to pick up South High into it. I think it's the more con, it's more compact. It kind of makes sense if you look at it. Um, the other maps kind of, with you know, maybe map 101, um, but we didn't really want to use that one because it really isn't relevant to the school attendance areas. But I think 103 with the notch in it at least has, it's compact. It doesn't have little fingers going out. It seems to be, for at least me, in looking at the community a, a little tighter. I can see the further modification of 103, um, but it's largely symbolic and it kind of splits Marvel Estates in half where that's kind of one cohesive um, group. So that's why I like 103 is that it really doesn't divide up what I would consider to be existing communities and it's pretty cohesive in how it works. So um, if I had to pick one, it's going to be a modification of 103 and it can either be the slight modification or the more radical one. Thank you. So to be clear, that means you prefer 103, either 103, 103A or 103B? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I like 103A the most, but 103 would be totally okay. Okay. Board President, if I can just clarify, uh, it's 103B is the notch one, and then 103C is the larger change. So preferring 103B with secondary 103C. Correct. Yes. OK. OK, anyone else? I'd like to uh, Mr. Gerson, Dr. Gerson, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, so, um, so we make a recommendation, and then it goes to the county. And how does? So let's say they don't like it. I mean, if they like it, we know what happens. But if they don't like it, could you kind of explain what happens after that? That's a good question. So <laughs> officially, this goes to the county committee as a petition, which there's some debate about. They definitely can say yes or no to your request um, for to implement the new map. There's some question about whether they can change the map, essentially adopt your petition, but with a different map. So traditionally, the interpretation has been no, they can't do that. They would have to initiate their own process separately. But uh, with Compton Unified, they actually changed that precedent, and they did approve the petition with a different map. So it is important that you get whatever public comment you can when they hold their hearing. Uh, which they will do in, in the Torrance Unified area. They come and hold it locally. But uh, yes, they've approved almost every petition, uh, Compton being the first one that they did not approve as requested. They actually changed the map. And there's some legal question about whether that's okay or not, but they did and no one fought them on it. Thank you. Hmm. Um, will they still be holding the meeting in person, even in these virtual times? No, they're holding it by Zoom, just like you are. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Okay, mm, any further comments, anyone? Yeah, um, i like yes. to say a few things. Sure, um, Mrs. Lear. I have a preference for map 103B or C, the new ones that Dr. Johnson um, amended. The reason, I'll, I'll go through this, um, Again, like I did last at the last meeting, but for map 101, um, ma the majority of us only represent one high school. And I, being that um, my main concern is, is that we all will act as one unified district and should be concerned about all the schools in our district wow. instead of just the ones that we represent. Um, I feel that each one of us trustees should have more than one school that they would represent. So in 101, um, South High School, North High School, and West High School will only, um, I'm sorry, three districts will only have one high school that represents them. Um, same with 104, there are also three, uh, there's only one high school represented by each one of the members. Uh, in map 102, 
it is okay in terms of each board member representing two or three um, uh, districts. However, North High School will be disadvantaged because they only have two board members representing them instead of three like everybody else. So I don't prefer that. And in map 103, um, A, one of the persons, uh, area D, only has one high school to represent. And therefore I worry about that person um, voting or, or working solely for that one high school instead of the district as a whole, as a unified whole. So map 103B and 103C. Ah, B has at least a high school in it. So in, uh, in district D, so that looks better so that the West High School District won't have two high schools in it. Um, and then 103 C, if I recall the letters correctly, has every board member representing two high schools. And um, that works for me too. And I think that makes the, the board more cohesive in terms of their decisions. So therefore I am good with 103C and also 103B. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Um, anybody else? Okay. Uh, Spencer. Yeah. Uh, good evening, members mm -hmm. of the board and board president. At some point in time, would you please ask if there are any comments from members of the public so that we know whether or not that opportunity has been provided. I didn't want to interrupt the board members, but I thought it'd be helpful that that was included within the questions. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Actually, we will do that at this moment before I uh, move forward to close the hearing. Are there any comments from the uh, public that are relative to these uh, maps? Dr. Stowe? Uh, no, Mrs. Reagans, we did not get any comments uh, on our website, nor did I get any sent to me. Okay. Just a quick question. Uh, yes, Mr. Hahn. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I just have a quick question about this whole process. Uh, I, I think it's very peculiar that we're drafting these maps based upon us five where we live. Um, we're making a precedent uh, for the way that we're going to go forward as a district um, just by where we live, right? It's weird because we're kind of creating a future map based upon what we're doing now. And when I look at these lines, they're kind of funky. You know, we're trying so hard to work around the high schools. I, I was just wondering from your experience, has that, looked been, has that been looked down upon? Like have previous board members or previous city councils been accused of trying to manipulate the maps just for their own personal sake rather than thinking about the holistic aspect of the city? I'm just curious. It, it's a very good question. And yes, certainly that comes up all the time. It's certainly the biggest complaint about maps mm -hmm. that ever comes up other than making the change at all. Um, we have, you know, we follow the law. We have adopted some maps. If you, if you Google search, you'll see some controversial maps that some of our jurisdictions have drawn that look fairly wild um, because a lot of board members live together. In Torrance's case, you have two things going on. One is that your board members already are quite well dispersed across the whole jurisdiction. So in looking at attendance zones, which are the most common consideration in drawing maps, you almost naturally end up with everyone in separate seats. Uh, obviously in Torrance Unified, we have two board members. So that was just as long as we were going to divide each trustee, I'm sorry, as long as we're going to divide each high school zone, in order to ensure multiple representatives, you might as well do it along a line that puts them in separate seats. So I, I don't, I would certainly not describe this process as being focused on where folks live. Believe me, we worked on projects that are much more focused on where people live and where they all live much closer together. I think as long as we were discussing maps that were based on council districts or maps based on high school attendance zones, or even maps based on like 104, keeping each uh, high school attendance zone unified as much as possible, then we also 
see it, of course, if you have to make a change, might as well do it so, th so that each member is in separate seed. And just to frame that properly, the, the way we always talk about that is that doesn't guarantee anyone re-election, which is the, the first thing that critics usually harp on is, so you're Gary Manning, you're protecting incumbent. Um, no, what it does is it means each board member can run and the voters get to decide whether each board member has earned re-election. If multiple board members are in one seat, it doesn't matter how much the voters love both of them, one of them is going to be out. Or one of them is going to be in the wrong year and not be able to run at all. So I would say, um, yes, it is something that the courts have said is fine to consider. Yes, it is something that the critics have harped on a lot. Um, and it's always a criticism. But we look at it, number one, here in Torrance Unified, it certainly has not been the driving factor. The big factor, as you've heard in this discussion, is which high school attendance zones um, are in which seats and how many seats does each zone have in it. Um, and then you already live fairly well spread out. So that was just a minor consideration. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it does. I, that, that's, that's why, why I, I feel, feel like, like, you know, when I look at these maps, like, like you're going to have a neighbor and a neighbor and they'll be like, two different board members, yet they live on the same street. That's just weird. It's just weird. You know, I, I just don't know how this whole thing works. So, yeah. Yeah, if I can- I just don't want to be seen as we're manipulating the system to benefit ourselves. And I appreciate that comment about- I appreciate the comment about not- Did, right? It's just, you know, we're doing it this way. Yeah, and, and one great anecdote that I cite all the time is in Menlo Park, um, they made some, similar to here, they didn't look at where the incumbents live as a primary driver, but they made some small adjustments. And so when the first four board council members came up, they all got to run. Two of them lost. <laughs> you know, the voters decided they hadn't earned re-election. This just means you get to run. It does not, as you've seen from the maps, no one gets a, a safe seat with their friends. Um, but I hope that helps clarify. Board President, I think you're muted. Okay, is that better? Um, okay, thanks uh, for all of those comments. Um, I do want to, to um, say that the district has previously requested comments. Each time we've had a hearing, we've asked that uh, folks give us feedback and input, um, and we don't have any to share this evening, so. Uh, we will move forward. And uh, after all of that, if there's nothing else, I will close the public hearing. Thank you all for participating. Our next item is adoption of a resolution approving a final map and sequence of elections. Can I get a motion in a second? Does the motion include which map? I believe so. Well, then. I'm gonna go along with Don's advice. I'm gonna rec I'm gonna move that we adopt Map 103B for all of the reasons that Mrs. Liu gave. Um, in addition to the added thing that Mr. Lee added about not breaking up um, the Marble Estates community, I think they've both spoken well about all the the pros to 103B. So I move that we accept that map. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, there's been a motion and a second that we adopt map 103B. Yes, uh, did somebody have a question, Mr. Lee? We've got the sequencing right in that um, Mrs. Reagan's and in other words, the sequencing would be that the three people who are up for reelection in 2022 <coughs> are in that sequence and then the people that are in Reagan's and I sequence will be up in 2024, correct? Yes, I believe that is correct. Can we see that map one more time, 103B? Dr. Johnson? Yes. Um, You're on. Okay. And... <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yep, that's yeah. the one. And just the way the sequencing works in all the maps is A and B 
are in um, 2024 and C, D, and E are in 2022. Did you want to see the other 103 too, Mr. Hahn? Or no, I, no, we were voting on 103B. That's why right? I, I, I want to make sure that it was the right one in my head. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's been moved in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I just this wanna, is Lou. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you, President Reagans. I just want to mention that I, I like 103B here. That's uh, displayed on um, on our on all our screens. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Johnson for following out our instructions from about two two meetings ago, two or three meetings ago, where we stated that we want each board member to uh, to to draw a map that can best um, make each board member represent more than just one high school. And um, of all the choices there, I believe this one looks the best too. So in other words, this looks good to, um, for the objective of trying to get more people, more districts represented by a board member. Okay, thank you. Any last words, anybody? Um, okay. Yeah, is that uh, is it, Dr. Gerson? Mm -hmm. Is it? I, so we we've, we've kind of mixed languages. So are are we calling them trustee areas to not be confused with city districts? And we're sticking with letters because the city uses numbers, and that's all included in all of this, right? Correct. It, if you wanted to change that, this would be the time to change it. But that's. Um, their schools always call them trustee areas um, just because it's weird to talk about the district in the district. Um, <laughs> so uh, District A in Torrance Unified School District, it just sounds weird. And the A, B, C, D, E is just to differentiate from the council when you have elections, but could you switch back if you don't like that? Just the way it is. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else? Last but not least. So we do have a motion and a second to approve the final map as 103B and the sequence of elections as uh, in the resolution. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. So from here on, it will be sent to the central committee or the district, uh, the county committee, sorry. I said that wrong. All right, go forth and do the next steps. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your service, Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to item number 9.3, notice of public hearing regarding public input pertaining to the waiver from the State Board of Education for the change to voting by trustee area. And I'm gonna call on Dr. Stowe to get us started on that discussion. Thank you, Mrs. Reagans and board members. Uh, I would actually like to turn this over to uh, Spencer Covert, who's uh, our counsel with Parker Covert, to speak to this item. Mr. Covert, should I read the beginning statement for the uh, hearing first? Yes, I think that would be a good idea if you would, please. Okay. I just realized I skipped over that. This is a duly noticed public hearing for public input pertaining to the waiver from the State Board of Education for change to voting by trustee area. At its June 15th, 2020 meeting, the Board of Education initiated a change to vote to voting by trustee area elections commencing with the November 2022 Board of Education elections. The education code requires that unless a waiver is obtained from the State Board of Education, the question of whether there should be a change to voting by trustee area elections be submitted to the voters. The costs of elections are high and a process exists where the ele election process may be waived by the State Board of Education under upon application. The State Board of Education waiver application requires a public hearing at which the school community consisting of employee collective bargaining units and school site and other councils be given an opportunity to express their views. And the district has previously requested the comments 
be emailed or submitted to the district. All right, Mr. Covert. Well, good evening, and this is the second part of this process. Uh, the reason for this action is that since 1984, the California Education Code has permitted a number of specific education code sections to be waived. Um, in light of the Voting Rights Act in California, there is a requirement that your approval uh, go to the uh, Los Angeles County Committee on School District Organization for their public hearing and final action. Uh, nevertheless, after that, there's an old time Ed Code section that says any change in boundaries with respect to trustee areas must be approved by the State Board of Education. For many years now, every district school district, and by the way, this is unique to school districts, doesn't have anything to do with cities, have submitted waivers in order to avoid the cost of an actual election after this matter has been already approved by the local board of education and by the county committee on school district organization. Each one of these uh, waiver applications is in turn routinely approved by the State Board of Education. If you did not adopt this waiver application, then it would be necessary to incur the cost of an election in June of 2022. So all school districts that go through this process, as I've indicated, make this waiver application once the redistricting has been approved by the county committee. There's also a process uh, whereby, as we indicated previously, uh, that notification be given uh, to uh, school district organizations, meaning uh, school side councils, uh, LMAC and DALMAC that has occurred in your district. Uh, notice has also gone out uh, to your exclusive representative employee organizations. There have been very few uh, responses <coughs> Uh, and those responses have been no comment. Uh, they were provided an opportunity, notice, and ability to sit a, submit a statement to you all as to approve, do not approve, or no comment. And the few comments that were received, I understand, indicated no comment. So now it is a recommendation of the superintendent and your legal counsel that this resolution be approved. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that comment. <clears throat> Is there any discussion about this from board members? And no comments, am I right, Dr. Stowe? Just double checking to make sure. Yes, I received a couple messages from uh, local school uh, PTAs that basically said no, no position, you know, they're neutral. Okay, well, following that um, lack of discussion, I do close this public hearing too. And we move on to 9.4, which is adopting resolution, approving submittal of the waiver request to the State Board of Education. So move. So move. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the waiver or submittal, excuse me, we approve submittal of the waiver request to the State Board of Education. Uh, any discussion whatsoever? No, hearing none. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and take a vote. Again, we are voting on the approving the submittal of the waiver request to the State Board of Education. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. So we approve submittal of that request. Thank you very much, Spencer, for explaining that to us. And Good we evening. will move on. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you, thanks for joining us. You're we welcome. will move on to oral communications and our unscheduled hearings for non-agenda items. 
The board does welcome input from the public in compliance with Governor Newsom's executive order N2520 in response to the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. The district will conduct the Board of Education's regular meeting as a teleconference, as you can see. In order to discuss district business in an orderly manner and to help staff respond more directly, board policies require that public comments to the board comply with certain procedures. Public comments can be submitted prior to 5 p.m. on the day of the board meeting by completing the appropriate submission form at tusd.org slash boe slash board meetings under quick links. Um, and two, that public comments to non-agenda items may address only items that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Time allotted for such comments is limited to three minutes per comment. And Mr. Hahn, can you time us if we have any comments? Uh, yes. Total time allotted for public input on non-agenda items is limited to 30 minutes. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another. The commenter's name must match the name on the public comment submission form. Complaints against employees or students will normally be heard in closed session and the district's complaint procedure should be followed before discussion with the board. The board may disconnect disruptive individuals from the teleconference if necessary. Any person who willfully disturbs any public school meeting is guilty of a misdemeanor, Ed Code 32210. And given that, um, I should have asked, do we have any oral communications for our unscheduled hearings, Dr. Stick? Yes, there are uh, three individuals and they are both in, or all three are in the attendee area and Mr. Mara will let them in. The first one is Stephanie Elwood. Welcome, Stephanie. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Stephanie Elwood and I'm an English teacher at West High School. I implore you to release us from our information overload wacky Wednesday. Our first Wednesday looked like this. We had a meeting with our principal, then we had two back-to-back -back PLC meetings, and then we had a meeting with another principal to talk about map testing, which was lost on most all of us because we were already fatigued. After that, we pushed ourselves through five rapid fire 35 minute classes with only five minutes between them. That is nine high stress zooms within seven short hours. We were utterly exhausted. And yes, teaching can be exhausting, but this is beyond anything we've ever experienced before. We want to give our best energy and enthusiasm to our students and this robs them of our best selves. Wednesday number two was such an incredible relief because we weren't forced into the information overload wacky Wednesday because of the holiday. Wednesday number three consisted of real training for the map test, which took most of the morning, followed by rapid fire instruction again, which was followed by back to school night, which was followed the very next day with reading map testing all day. And then of course the next day the same which was a nightmare. If not for Eric Lockhart's training and on-call support, I couldn't have done it. This upcoming Wednesday will consist of three meetings in the morning, followed by teaching five rapid fire classes again. We desperately need asynchronous instruction on Wednesdays like other high schools are doing, or we need relief from this horrendous onslaught of meetings all morning. Something has to give. Please provide the space and peace for us to be the teachers we can and want to be, the teachers Torrance students need and want and deserve. Please release us from this information overload wacky Wednesday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comment. And our next speaker. Uh, Gil, the, the next person, I believe, is um, Ann Cortina. Oh, there she is. Hi, Ann. Hello. Ann, Hi. 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 Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, speak tonight on behalf of myself and other teachers at West High School. I am a science teacher at West High School. 
And I will be glad to get back to the classroom with my students so that we can resume hands-on activities such as labs. And I know that a lot of teachers at West High School feel the same way. However, there are some worries that we have concerning this. My classroom has fixed lab tables that accommodate 32 students. In my classroom, where chemicals, Bunsen burners, scalpels, and other potentially hazardous materials may be part of the everyday learning experience, 32 students situated at 32 fixed lab stations is considered to be the maximum number that can be safely accommodated. In a COVID year, however, that number drops to 16 so that we can maintain safe social distancing. However, in one of my sections right now, I have 36 students. I am not alone at West High School in having sections where we have many more students than we would normally have in a regular year, let alone a COVID year. When I have 36 students, that means that I will have 18 students together at one time in my classroom when we go back to in-person learning. This will not allow safe distancing. I have taken a tape measure out and measured it. And when I discovered the extra students on my roster, I brought it up with my department chair who passed my concern along to my supervising assistant principal. I received the response that extra tables would be placed in my room to supply seating for the two extra students. However, in my room, there's no place where I can put two extra tables in such a way as students sitting at them could fully participate in a lesson. Since the model that we will be using, half of the class in person with the other half learning uh, synchronously, that will require me to conduct lessons using my computer in order to simultaneously connect with all of those students. So the situation would put those extra two students at a serious disadvantage. This brings me to my next concern, which has to do with technology. Can we be assured that every single in-person student will be provided a Chromebook while they are in the classroom? This is really the only safe way during COVID to deliver Hi. instruction. Uh, your time's up, actually, Anne. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Um, you can send your uh, the rest of your written statement to us if you'd like. Okay, moving on. We have a third speaker. Yes, Sandy Hutchinson. Hey, Sandy, come on. Tell us what you have this evening. Hi. Um, hi. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I'm Tim Stowe, cabinet and school board members. My name is Sandy Hutchinson. I'm a distance learning four or five combo teacher at Riviera. I feel compelled to speak up as I'm hopeful the district will work with and listen to TTA and teachers. I implore you to listen to the teachers and adhere to the MOUs. I am exhausted, stressed, and anxious, as I'm sure many of you are also. The decisions from the task force meetings the distance learning platform and the possible opening of bringing students back on campus is adding to an already stressful situation. Please work with TTA negotiators on the present and future MOUs and listen to teachers. I had great hope that the task force would be a way this district would use teacher input to help our students. I know the cabinet board members and many teachers worked overtime this summer on countless committees. I unfortunately have heard reports from teachers on those committees that dis the district was not listening. They said the task force leaders and those outside of the classroom were making many of the decisions. Please listen to the teachers since they are the ones on the front lines. The platform will ele where elementary school distance learning students are getting their asynchronous instruction is a wonderful collection of lessons, far beyond whatever I could create on my own. 
However, it is so rigorous that my students and I are struggling to keep up the pace. Many students are frustrated, switching to blended, and I fear some are even leaving the district. Parents who are working from home and need um, a platform that is at their child's level, not something they need to constantly help them with. The stress levels of the teachers, parents, and students is evident in the movement of students out of the distant learning and out of the district. Please listen to teachers, parents, and students. Finally, making sure that all staff and students feel safe when it is time to bring people on campus should be paramount. I am again hopeful that the district will take every precaution to keep all staff and students safe. Prolonging the opening of campus until you can guarantee everyone's safety. Please listen and work with TTA negotiators and truly listen to the teachers, parents, and students. Their lives and safety are quite literally in your hands. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comment, Sandy. Uh, anyone else, Dr. Stowe? Okay. So that ends our unscheduled hearings on non-agenda items. And we will move on to discussion action items. Again, I want to give instructions to the public Speakers wishing to address the board of uh, uh, on agenda topics must complete the appropriate submission form on the district website at tosd.org slash BOE slash board meetings under quick links prior to 5 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. Speakers are permitted three minutes per topic and the total time granted for public input shall be limited to 30 minutes per topic. The board <clears throat> policies require that public comments to the board comply with the procedures that were previously listed um, in communications. So we have item 11.2, which is adoption of the 2020-2021 Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan. And it's not the LCAP, but it's the LCP. Is that right, Dr. Crumpy? Yes, that's what we've named it just to not be um... Just, just to differentiate between, between the two plans, yes. Okay, go ahead. Well, as, as the presentation was, was um, at our last meeting, um, based on the requirements to have um, the presentation and public hearing um, at a meeting separate from, from the approval, um, we, we, um, and Dr. McDowell is here in case there are any questions as well, very instrumental in um, writing the plan and um, and creating a way that that I think we both can support our students um, as we as we move forward um, with our with, um, with our school year, but also create the flexibility so that we can pivot um, in, in listening and um, you know to things we've heard tonight and how can we support um, our students and our teachers and our families as we move forward. Um, but also maintaining the, the um, integrity and fidelity of, of the, the lost learning plan. So with that, we ask for the approval of the LCP, um, LCP. Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan this evening. Okay. Right. Any comments, questions? Mr. Lee, did you have something? No, I was just going to make a motion to approve. Okay. Is there a second? <clears throat> Can I have a question okay. on this? Yeah, how about a second first, though? Second. Second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. And discussion. Mr. Hahn. Uh, Dr. Crumpy, just a quick question. Uh, there's been a lot of complaints about the, um, the mapping um, process. I know that a lot of the computers went down. The kids felt overwhelmed. Uh, people were lost. Uh, the question I have was, was this communicated to the parents that this assessment test was going to be given? Um, yes, I mean it's okay. been it it was there were even um, um, some parent trainings there were trainings and information given. This is a requirement um, that we have a way to measure um, LCP. Um, we you know we had a committee that looked at 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 a lot of different platforms. You know we, it's very difficult to give a standardized test via home via dis, you know via distance learning. Um, but but what what um, compounded the problem is that the map site um, went down um, nationwide. And so there's, they have had some technical issues which did not help um, 
help us in our in our delivery. That being said, um, we're we're look you know as as the data as the kids that have finished the test and the, the it's being put in in a way that um, our our teachers will be given the data back. Um, our our teachers will help us decide whether or not this is useful data, um, and and whether we can, you know to continue to give it as a as a measurement indicator or not. If it's not useful information, um, we won't we won't give it a second time. The thought was, especially in our elementary schools, that that um, giving a running record, which is a one on one assessment, and some of the math work that we do is so labor intensive, and what you know, and the one on one would be. Um, we thought this would be simpler um, and an easier way to get to get information was to give a 30 to 45 minute, you know, um, multiple choice exam and then be able to have that discussion on whether we got good information or not. Um, it's it, the, the technology at the beginning of the year has been has been a challenge. And if we change the assessment, are we going to use a different assessment then? Well, so so many of these assessments um, give us data back in a in a standardized way. Many of them use what's called a Lexile, and we can then convert that Lexile okay. into what that running record would would be um, um, most most in line with, and then and then go that route. Good question. It was a frustrating uh, process for many of our parents and students. Yeah. I. Have similarly heard. Yes. Okay. But Mrs. Rose, yeah, we, as Dr. Crumpy mentioned, um, this is a nationwide assessment. It's uh, through a very reputable organization, um, and and so, I mean, it's it wasn't just us what, that this mm -hmm. happened to, um, and, and um, you know, as part of our learning loss mitigation funds that we received, we do have to try to demonstrate that we are trying to assess what learning loss uh, occurred and how we're going to remediate that. So that, that was the intent on, on the assessment. Is the process still ongoing, Dr. Crumpy? Are we still testing? Um, yes, especially, so we had, we had two elementary schools that, you know, that started out, wanted to go first. Um, and, and when we saw that with the site going down, we actually gave people permission to stop and wait some of them decided to keep going um, because it had already been scheduled and, and you know the lessons had, lesson plans had already been created around around that some sites um, you know recorded very little issues and 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 some you know and some more um, so so I, I I hope it's getting better but we did give some permission for for them to wait and make sure that we get some verified you know um, stability in place from the map um, map site um, before everybody everybody move forward. Okay, so it's all in process still. Uh, any further questions or comments from anyone about the LCP just, or just, just yes, Mr. Hahn? So, Dr. Copy, I appreciate this because we've been getting a lot of questions about learning loss, and mm -hmm. I think that people feel like everyone's falling behind. And so, I guess we need this assessment to give us a good idea where we're really at, I think. Well, yes, and as we, as, as things hopefully stabilize and we, we really are taking all of the, the comments and the input, you know, to heart and, and trying to modify and adjust, um, you know, the distance learning platform and the, 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 the work quantity and, and, you know, and all of those things, um, we, as, as, things, as things stabilize, we really do need to work on our tier two and our tier three interventions um, and and how will and, and knowing which kids and, and you know, um, which kids to help and how to help them. Um, this is this is uh, integral to that um, as presented in the last week as we began just today, um, because today marked the first day that we had two schools that had some beginning of, a, of special ed assessments happen. Um, so we're the the timeline is that today was our start date to start talking about the the small learning cohorts or learning pods um, that that tentatively are scheduled to come back October fifth. This is also data that will help utilize bringing back the the students that that need it the most, you know, back first. Um, and so how do we de how do we really decide when we can only bring ten percent of kids back? Which which ten percent? And so this is data that will will we will use to 
um, assist us with that as well. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second to adopt the 2021 Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan, the LCP. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you for your hard work on that, Dr. Dowell and Dr. Crumpy. I know that's a lot of work. <clears throat> and we will move on to our next um, action item, which is approval of the revised resolution of the Board of Education of the Torrance Unified School District, approving ongoing actions to respond effectively to the impact of COVID-19 on district schools through the 2021 school year. And Dr. Stowe, you wanna head us on that? If we could get a motion in a second, please. Oh, yep. I'll move. Do I have a second? Anybody? Sure. Yes. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All right, All right. Dr. Stowe. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Regans and, and board members. Um, just, just a little background and, and to kind of bring people up to speed because um, this, uh, this, this resolution was originally approved back in March when we shut the schools uh, in response to the, the COVID outbreak initially. Um, I brought it back to the board uh, for uh, approval and, and an update in, uh, in August at our meeting on August 17th to allow for um, some special education students to be on campus, uh, for our teachers to work from our classrooms uh, and, and other employees who uh, to, to work on campus. Um, and, and so bringing back to you now for some of the things that we discussed at our meeting on September 8th. Um, but just to, so that everybody has an understanding of the, the tiers, uh, the, the four tiers that the state has put in place. Um, we are, as, as you know, uh, in LA County and each county has to um, meet certain criteria in order for, for schools to reopen uh, physically. Um, so every county is assigned uh, to a tier in, in this four tier system. And currently LA County is in what is considered the, the widespread or the purple tier, they're, they're colored. Uh, and so it, it, we are in the, the, the lower tier, well, I guess on their, their chart, it's the, the upper tier, um, meaning that we can't open physically um, and because of, of the, the, the rates. And so, in order for uh, a county to advance uh, in, in this uh, and to get to the red tier, which would be the next one for us, um, a county must meet certain criteria for the, least, for the less restrictive tier uh, in, in two different measures for two consecutive weeks. Uh, those measures are um, positivity rate of, of testing, and, and currently LA County has a low positivity rate of 3.2%. Uh, which would actually get us in the third tier up. Um, but we, we have a higher uh, number, which is keeping us, us here, of a new daily case rate of 8.1 per 100,000 residents. Um, this would, um, in order for us to move to the next level, we would have to have seven or fewer uh, cases uh, in, in uh, per 100,000 residents. And so the numbers are, are updated each week. So I look forward to see what the numbers are this week. Uh, but at the current time, uh, we are still here. Uh, and, and so under this order, schools are not um, permitted to reopen for in-person instruction uh, in, unless they receive a waiver from the local health department for uh, TK through six uh, grades. But as you also know, LA County Department of Public Health is not accepting waivers. And so um, we, we, are, um, we, we cannot open for, for, for in-person in instruction until the county has been um, uh, in, in this, um, you know, ha is, is below that, that uh, seven uh, cases per 100,000 residents for two weeks. And then once you're at that next level, uh, which is what they call the substantial or the red tier, we need to remain there for at least two consecutive weeks in order to then reopen. So we're looking really at, 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 at the soonest, it would be you know, four to five weeks, um, but again, it's, it's dependent on, on the numbers. 
At this point in time, however, we are allowed to open for uh, some students in a, in a very limited way. And so that uh, brings us to tonight's resolution, where I'm asking the board to amend the previous resolution by adding three allowable areas. One, specialized, in, specialized and in-school services for small cohorts of high-need students. We talked about this at our September 8th meeting. Uh, we presented that these would be for, for special education and uh, English learner students who would come back at a, a 12 student to, to uh, two adult ratio. Um, and um, in, in all likelihood, it's probably going to be um, 10 students to um, you know, three or four adults uh, because of, of the, the, the needs that some of our students have. Um, we are targeting October 5th as the week that those students would be um, back on campus uh, first. Uh, the county did approve that starting for uh, the date of September 14th. So we are about three weeks, uh, bringing those students on about three weeks later than is allowed by the county because we want to make sure that we have all the safety protocols and all of the um, procedures in place for our staff and our students. The second amendment to this um, uh, allowable area for the resolution are for recreational youth sports and sports sponsored by our schools. Uh, again, th these, this is um, a language specifically uh, in, the, one of the, in the appendix of the um, Department of Public Health for LA County Health Orders, and that is allowable and has been actually for, for um, since, since the summer, but, but again, we, we needed to make sure that we took our time with this. And then the third um, uh, change to the resolution that I'm asking the board to approve deals with our adult education programs for essential workers and high need students. We have some adult education programs in, um, in, in the medical field, uh, as well as some uh, GED courses that, um, that need to be completed for students to uh, be able to earn certificates. And so, um, those, that is uh, what we're, we're putting on this resolution for tonight. I do understand that there are other groups that would like to return. Um, I've heard from some, I know many of you have heard from some, uh, but these currently are the only allowed groups that the Department of Public Health has provided guidance on at this point in time. Um, we do intend for uh, our sports to come back and, and following strict guidance uh, for conditioning and independent skill work only. Uh, and these, again, will be also in small cohorts, uh, and we're looking at, at those to begin sometime next week. Uh, Dr. Egan, Dr. Butler, I know have met with the high school athletic directors and coaches uh, and, and, and administrators in um, bringing them along with, uh, with, with the guidance. So we will be following all the, the DPH guidelines. Uh, some of the things, just for your information, that we put in place are uh, new cleaning and disinfecting protocols using both DPH and CDC approved uh, materials and solutions. We have desk shields and PPE for all staff, uh, all applicable staff for the desk shields and, and we've uh, delivered significant amount of PPE to the school sites. And uh, as, as uh, Dr. Butler also presented last week, we're carrying uh, quite a bit of surplus in the uh, of materials here in the warehouse. We have reusable and disposable masks available for all students and staff. We have placed signage throughout the campuses to promote health, healthy hygiene practices, as well as to assist with physical distancing in the school buildings and common areas. Uh, we have implemented uh, uh, systems for staff and student daily COVID-19 symptom checks. We've got additional hand sanitizing stations placed around all the school sites and offices. Uh, we have a return to work uh, task force checklist for all site administrators. Uh, we have completed um, the Department of Public Health uh, uh, in-person support and, and services notification form, which is required um, by the uh, Department of Public Health five days prior to bringing students on campus. We did that last week. Uh, we've also uh, developed and, and are putting in place a containment response and control plan and have scheduled health training for um, our, our office staff uh, and our, our health our health service uh, staff, uh, which will be recorded next week and offered to all employees uh, for their information. And then we continue to um, uh, provide 
uh, information and resources and um, we're, we're gathering uh, some other materials to make sure that that we have uh, a document out to our staff next week uh, for all of the uh, safety things that we put in place and things to make them feel safe for, for uh, their return uh, to, to work with students physically um, in person. So um, at this point in time, we're happy to take any questions, uh, but I, I ask for the board to approve this resolution uh, to allow us to continue to um, comply with the, the county health orders and, and bring some students back on campus. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Dr. Stowe. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, you did say, um, but I wanted to repeat it, that even though it says recreational youth sports and sports sponsored by public schools, that that is only for conditioning and skill development. It is not to be playing games. Is that correct? Correct. There are uh, no competitions. Um, and when we say recreational youth sports, those are for some of our community groups. And so um, Dr. Butler is, is going to be working with those groups. We will be issuing some permits. Uh, the city has uh, allowed permits for their fields um, for probably the last two to three weeks. Uh, and so we will be following their guidance. Um, actually, we, we uh, got a copy of the waiver that they use for, for their outside groups and um, we, we've modified that to uh, fit our needs. But yes, absolutely no competitions. Don't, don't be getting your hopes up that you're gonna come back and start playing games. This is uh, conditioning, uh, again, cohorts, uh, 10 to 12 students, um, physical distancing, masks, um, and, and all of the, um, the appropriate uh, safety protocols in place uh, per the, C the Department of Public Health. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any questions from board members? Um, Ms. Dr. Gerson. Yeah. Um, I know that um, almost all of my fellow board members um, were taking tours of schools as soon as instruction came back. And as I told Dr. Stowe, I wanted to wait um, until the last possible moment um, before this resolution coming out. And I wanted a, a larger picture, not just of, of teachers um, uh, behind screens. So I was very happy with what I saw. Um, I asked in offices about plexiglass. I was able to inspect it saw the exact same plexiglass that's used in my Torrance Memorial Medical Center doctor's office. Um, I was able to observe custodian at work um, and then afterward ask about cleaning protocols, which, you know, knowledgeable, um, clearly been trained. Um, we're not at the point of students coming back to classrooms. So some classrooms, you know, ready, some classrooms not, but that that's not expected to be done yet. Um, the the list that you provided today of all the delivered PPE to all the school sites was in, incredibly helpful. Um, knowing that on, on a level of safety, all of you have done a very conscientious job and have worked very hard at making sure that, that we are as safe as possible. Um, I, I know uh, Mrs. Hutchins said, and until we're, we are perfectly safe. And I know that during a, a pandemic, there's no such thing as total and perfect safety. Um, but I do believe that you have all worked extremely hard on the safety end of things. And, and as far as safety goes, I'm, I'm very happy with how much work you've done on this and preparation. Um, and happy to hear uh, today that, um, that you'll also be working with the principals tomorrow to make sure that they um, convey to any of their, their staff that are unaware of how they're gonna get access to, to PPE. That not only is it there, but how they're gonna get access to it, which is great. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, and it, mm -hmm. it fits into, um, we're already letting childcare happen. As a part of our tour, you know, I asked um, to visit the, one of the YMCA childcare sites and we talked a little bit about um, internet coverage. I wanted to ask if we've made any progress in that conversation to make sure that our students who are in childcare um, will be making sure that internet coverage from our, from our school sites will still allow our students to have access 
to their um, to their teachers and to um, any materials that we provide via the internet. So have, have we made any progress on that or? I'll, I'll let Mr. Mara answer that question that was uh, specifically in uh, a small wing over at Towers Elementary School and the, the, the Y classroom. So Gil, do you have any update on that? Yeah, there was an issue with the wireless access point in room 26 over at Towers. Uh, we couldn't reach it, couldn't ping it, so we determined it was basically broken. So we had someone uh, go up on the ceiling, replace it so that that unit's functioning now, and so they've got coverage. I know that at some of the Y buildings, um, they they provided their they provide their own telco and internet service. So I'm working with Dr. Butler to try and see if we can't get our own network extended into some of those buildings. Uh, but for the classrooms where our own kids are, uh, I should say in the classrooms that are, are our classrooms, uh, we've determined that all of the wireless access points are functioning at this point. And, yeah. uh, as no, always, I, they can always reach contact. Today is, is their buildings, but, but they are our They're our buildings, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. uh, so for the, moving on to the athletics section, you know, it feels a little weird to be saying athletics before academics, but um, is there, um, so the, the coach training has, has it commenced yet? Uh, I'll let Dr. Egan, uh, if you could answer that and uh, talk about the process. Uh, yeah, so the, the training is essentially um, multi-layered, I guess you could say in many ways, because it it's already begun with um, creating a foundation of information on uh, what the Department of Public Health reopening for youth sports protocols uh, requires, which um, of course the Department of Public Health has reopening of schools as well. Um, so we've been working with administrators to uh, really try to tackle both. But um, the one that aligns most closely is the youth sports open, reopening protocol. So we've, we've been providing uh, that information to a leadership team of um, assistant principals, principals, and athletic directors, which many of, uh, of whom are coaches as well, who then have been going back and meeting directly with their entire coaching staff to talk through one layer at a time. Um, so the, the training continues in a sense uh, with building a school plan um, that provides the narrative details of what the youth sports reopening checklist asks for. Um, so Dr. Butler and I have um, also had access to those since last week in draft form and been reviewing them. Uh, but then the uh, coaches themselves are going to be responsible for working with those uh, lead folks from each school to develop their own sport related protocol, which includes how do I group uh, the students appropriately to be in these small pods or cohorts, as Dr. Stowe described, um, while also um, ensuring that I don't have uh, any cross-contamination of athletes uh, while they're training. And uh, so, so that process continues. Um, in addition, um, there's a, uh, uh, Dr. Butler, but the Words are escaping me, but uh, of course, um, and, and a sense, waiver. Yeah. The, the uh, in addition, there's. Um, I was referring to the. Um, I don't know why. I'm sorry, Dr. Gerson. My, the words are escaping me. But there, there's essentially a uh, an online um, process that the coach has. To, coaches have to complete as well um, from an outside organization that attests that they understand. Um, what the safety protocols entail, hygiene practices, um, COVID awareness, and, and those kinds of things. Um, so they'll participate in that as well. Um, part of our, our near future uh, hope is that, you know, should the board agree that we're ready to move forward with this next step would be then um, educating coaches, parents, and students uh, all at the same time on the school level, uh, much like uh, the presentations and Q&As that we've done for other stages of things throughout, all prior to bringing anyone back on campus so that uh, the message is clear, questions are asked and answered, and um, that the plans are firmly in place, uh, as you mentioned, to ensure that we're as safe as possible and adhering to the guidelines. Thank you. So um, previously I had asked about cohorting and you had said that we're probably, at least 
a month ago, we were talking about five people, and Dr. Stowe on the other end was saying 10 to 12. What should parents expect as far as physical fitness? What does a high school cohort look like? Um, the guidelines that we've agreed to uh, internally, we're, we're aligning ourselves with what CIF recommends. CIF recommends 10. Um, of course, CIF doesn't give us um, direct specific uh, guidance um, as a rule. However, it's, it's a practice that we intend to follow. Um, so we're working with a number of up to 12. Part of that has to do with the makeup of certain team rosters so that we don't have a cohort of four, a cohort of four, a cohort of four, and then have problems with supervision. Um, so we're going with the number that we use for the um, uh, small group cohort uh, intervention uh, that was spoken to earlier tonight. Uh, and we've, we've determined that if it's okay to have 12 with some supervision indoors that uh, we're comfortable stretching the CIF guidance from 10 to 12, which uh, in phase one CIF, uh, their guidance indicates 10. And I, let me add to that, if I may, uh, Department of Public Health does not have a specific number for this particular activity. Uh, again, you know the numbers for indoor activity, outdoor, all they say is uh, that you should consider shrinking the size of your groups, but it doesn't even mention cohorts that way. We're taking it that extra step. Will we be operating under stable cohorts or will there be mixing between the athletic trainer training? Uh, the intent is to have stable cohorts, and that's the direction that all the schools have agreed to, um, and which they've also disseminated as terms to their coaches. Um, we know there may be some uh, circumstances where um, a coach may need to supervise uh, multiple cohorts. So the direction that they've been given in those circumstances that then the coach has to supervise um, from a distance of 15 feet or more. Um, and not interact uh, in close contact with any cohort. Uh, that way, uh, the cohorts themselves are kept separate and the coach is kept separate from crossing from one cohort to the other, which we think is feasible in, in the outdoor arena uh, with some of the space and distance uh, visibility that they're able to have. Uh, last time we talked, you said that there was the possibility of athletic directors and security and others who might be monitoring, is that still in place? Yes, yeah, there's an expectation that uh, the, essentially the first week, it'll just be all hands on deck. Um, principals, assistant principals, athletic directors, monitors, uh, to really give us um, a lot of eyes uh, and information um, and guidance for people who are learning to make sure that they follow the appropriate practices and then It'll continue uh, with monitors in place, which could include any of those folks, but certainly uh, we have some folks in classifications that uh, currently could um, provide some service with some training and, and we're, we're calling them monitors. Uh, those would be folks who would be asked to just be eyes and ears um, and have protocol to report back to the administrator if there's something that um, needs more specific attention or direction from them. Are we taking any responsibility for going and coming from campus? Yes, so that's all part of the plan. Um, and that's, that's part of what we intend to be uh, one of the outcomes from the, the local school uh, presentation and Q and A's is to be able to have a clear consistent message um, that's discussed with parents and students about uh, the strict timing of coming and going uh, to make sure that there's no congregating. Um, also, that's part of the coaches training that they've already received and messaging that they'll continue to be, have reiterated to them uh, that when they dismiss their team, uh, they are to continue to monitor them to make sure that they go to the proper exit place. Um, you know, we want to continue watching, you know, to encourage that, um, you know, we really want to make sure that we're all responsible and getting this right. Um, and if practice ends at four o'clock, that would be uh, advisable for parents to be there a few minutes prior. Uh, to make sure that they're ready to just to grab their child um, you know in their vehicle and, and leave when the time comes so that students aren't walking home in large groups and defeating the purpose of the cohorting that we have in place. Thank you. On the other side of things when we start giving permits to recreational youth sports what responsibility are we taking for the people on our property to make sure that they're following DPH and TUSD guidelines? So we're looking at that at starting a week after 
we do our internal sports just so that we can see how the monitoring process goes. I know that we can learn from working with our own sports first. Then we will be monitoring those groups as well. Uh, we have not yet determined if we're going to charge an additional fee for that monitoring and or cleaning. Because again, just to be honest, until we get out there and do it, uh, I'm not clear exactly on what we'll need to do to then roll that out for the sports teams. But we are beginning right now by the permitting process of them giving us the hours and the location that they're interested in. We're setting up everything that way. And then once we are clear that we have the monitoring place, uh, the monitoring process in place, then we'll roll out to community sports as well. One last question. And the, <laughs> this is on behalf of, of Mr. Hunt. Um, <laughs> so, do we have any protocols set in place for field protection? Uh, fall is coming. There have been a lot of fires. Rain is in is eventually going to come. Our fields are gorgeous. Um, what protections do we have in place? Um, because this is this is all new. We're going to be issuing new permits. What are what are our protocols and what are we telling uh, the local sports groups about us and our uh, field maintenance? Uh, this is actually completely new to me for Torrance and knowing what it is that your protocols have already been, but I appreciate you bringing that up. I'll touch base with Ian and Richard and I'll find out where our processes are and we'll make sure that they're followed and our fields are protected. Well, I, and I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Our fields are in great shape, Dr. Gerson. There's been nobody on them for months. Um, and I, I believe our, our last school board meeting in person was the night that uh, we, the gentleman that yeah. we hired to do our field uh, assessment came. Mm -hmm. So we've had, and I had plenty of talk with, with Richard and, and Ian, our uh, mm -hmm. maintenance operations uh, over, over the spring, that it gave so much time for our guys to get our fields in great shape uh, because nobody was on them. Um, but while, while we don't have a, a formal policy and, and that is something that we'll work on, um, I, we, you know, the, the fact that most of the wear and tear came at the, after the school day um, with all the, the games and multiple students you know, playing on there, um, that the fact that we won't have competition is going to allow us a, a little more time to be able to put something in place that's that's going to work. Um, but I mean, the fields are they they really are in great shape, um, and you know certainly it, we joke about it, but we wish that we could have uh, kids out there playing and 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 being active. Um, but but we will um, make sure that that as as the usage increases, that we do have. Uh, some protocols, you know, no playing after rain for X number of hours or um, other kinds of uh, uh, systems to be able to rotate fields and make sure that, that they aren't getting torn up. I got the message behind the message. <laughs> it's all yours, Mr. Lee. I think that's really important because we got a great opportunity. We were all kind of struggling and how we follow and then rotating through and everything else. One of the things we had talked about was maybe coordinating with the city of Torrance because AYSS is their field and how we can make this um, through, um, and how to manage it through because, you know, obviously we, we're not working in isolation as far as dealing with these groups, especially AYSO because they're probably the number one user. The other thing is, I would love to see those protocols or whatever those may be before we fully open up the schools because that sets the expectation. Um, certainly, you know, Redondo is doing some interesting things as far as um, receiving some forms of compensation for how much their fields are being used. I know we don't have that yet. Um, maybe this is the time prior to all of this opening that maybe we start those conversations. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you were saying that before we do a full scale open, that's when you want to have the policies in place or just to be clear, were you asking for all that to be in place before we even bring back the conditioning? Well, I mean, we bring back the conditioning, but just tell them ahead of time that we're going to have new protocols and the way we did it before is probably not the best environment. Honestly, we're doing this so kids don't get hurt. Right. And so 
you know, so let's, if we set it up now, then we're really not jumping back into it in a total overuse. And if we're gonna change the rules or how we manage it, it's probably better to do it now before everybody arrives on a Saturday afternoon to start having AYSO games again. So it's probably, this is probably the time because the boards don't have a lot to do right now. So maybe they, we can get them all focused on, you know, how we're gonna preserve our fields and the condition they are now. And, and we do typically bring that uh, uh, rate sheet or additional uh, up, update to the board in December. So we can, uh, this is the perfect time to start working on that. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, thank you. Any other board uh, comments? Mr. Ahn. Uh, just a quick question about the belts. So just for clarification on these cohorts that are coming back. So it's gonna, it sounds like it's gonna be a rollout on these cohorts that are coming back. We're not, we're doing a little bit at a time or are we bringing all our special needs at the same time? Like, give me an idea how this works. For example, launch is only bringing one class. So I've been getting emails about how come it's only one class. So is launch gonna bring back another class a week later and then another class a week later? You know, how does this rollout look? And how many are you thinking? So I don't want it to be just like three cohorts of 10, you know, you're getting my excitement high when it's only gonna be three cohorts. I would like to see it be like seven cohorts. So I'm just wondering Maybe how 10%. this working out. That's sorry, 10%, 70, 10%. Sure. So, um, so I'm I'm going to ask Dr. Crumpy to answer some of this question, but we are restricted um, to to no more than 10% of the student population of a particular school on campus at any one time, uh, and they need to be stable cohorts. So, um, meaning a, a, a teacher uh, who works with 10 to 12 students in their cohort, they can't have another cohort that comes maybe in the afternoon or different days of the week. So. Um, it, it, it does restrict us in, in that. Um, you know, we have some elementary schools of 300 kids uh, or, or, you know, the, the, or 400 students. So, you know, we're looking at only 30 to 40 uh, students on, on campus at any one time. Um, and, and so Dr. Crumpy has been working with our special education and, and ELD department as far as the rollout and, and scheduling. So, so would you like to answer that please? Sure. So I, I think you know, we don't want to phase this until January. I mean, I, I don't think that was, that was the intent, but we also do want to start slow to go fast and to get, um, I think I stole that from Dr. Stowe. Um, and, and, and I took it from John Wooden, so. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there we go. So, you know, and so it, it kind of really depends. So just today was the due date for our, our, families in self-contained classrooms to let us know what they were thinking. So they had, they've been given an, um, um, I need a new word for survey, but they've been given a survey to let us know whether or not um, if we were to bring their child back for specialized services, whether they were interested or not in bringing their kids back. So, um, uh, so starting tomorrow, we, we're going to start looking, you know, looking at those numbers. And we, when we had our edu educational services meeting this morning, um, you know, the numbers at 7 a.m. versus the numbers at 10 a.m. had like almost doubled. So we'll, we'll see tomorrow um, what, you know, what that looks like um, and, then, and then go from there. But we do, um, we do have, and, and again, with our principals meeting tomorrow, also get a little bit more um, input from them um, on the non um, self contained classroom side, the English learners, the homeless foster youth that they've been just just thinking about um, and whether or not their school is large enough to even, you know, have two schools start, you know, two classes start at the same time. So I think our initial idea was to um, find out our, mo our um, self contained um, specialized uh, services for kids on an IEP because we've got to bus many of those kids, you know, to those sites. And then from there, two weeks after that, like no longer than two weeks, that was kind of our, our phased in approach is that we would start with a cohort, 
or two cohorts on a site, depending on the size and the need. And then, and then make sure that everything's going well, see how it goes for a week, and then have a discussion with leadership at, at sites to be able to see what needs to be modified and adjusted. Give them time to do that and then bring the next group, you know, group onto, onto campus. Um, and so again, we don't, we don't want to wait till, you know, January, but we do want to kind of do this in a, in a couple of phases, a couple of weeks apart to make sure that we get this right. And that's why I kind of wanted to get a good number because I have my when we say this. Yeah. But listening today, I feel like I have to temper my expectation because wait, I'm not even talking about January because I'm talking about November. Well, that's why because, you know, even Dr. Farrar said that if we go back, the early is just going to be the beginning of November. It's, uh, yeah. The thing is, we got to, we got to make this process a little quicker because, you know, I don't want us to delay the opening of the school in November because we still figured out how we're going to do these cohorts. And so you're talking about January. I feel like I got to really temper my expectations. Now. I was Joe. I yeah. no. I okay. said. I said we don't want to wait until Jan. Okay. We don't want to phase this in all the way to January. I I think I was I was joking. But but we we were reminded today in our task force meeting something that I know really resonated with me, and that is. I think many of us have been living this every day since March 13th and, and in how many focus groups and how many um, uh, DPH and, and Los Angeles County Office of Ed and CDC and, um, you know, that, um, um, you know, Zoom meetings and, and focus group meetings that we've sat in that for a lot of our families, students and staff, um, this is, this is their, their, we, we've got to train them. We've got to make them feel comfortable. We, we need to make sure that they're safe, you know, coming back to campus. They are not as, um, um, in, they have not all been as involved, um, at such this, at this level. And I, and I think that really resonated with me that we, we really need to reach out and make sure that every single person coming onto campus feels, feels safe. And I, and I think that will go rather quickly. Um, but we need to take that step. And I, and I think that's why when we start our first cohort or pod um, on, on October 5th, that we need to only do one or two per school to start um, at, before we can, before we can e expand that. I, I, I sh James, when you hear um, you know, some of the stories we're hearing some, from some of our families, you know, I, I share your, um, your, your opinion. And, and that, but then I also have to balance it. And I think we all have to balance it with making sure that, that we've got everything put in place and, and are, you know, and are, and are ready to go as well. And, and I appreciate that. And that's why I'm just trying to gauge my expectation, I think right now, because we have this announcement that we're bringing kids back. And so people hear that and they're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to get that email. So my, that's why I'm getting the emails now saying, how come we didn't hear anything yet? And then today I got an email launch is only having one preschool. I said, well, I'm sure we're phasing these things in. I understand that. I get it. But my concern here, Katie, Dr. Crumpy, is when we get the green light to come back at hybrid, are we going to take the slow fast push again too, where you're going to take a month to slowly phase in these kids because of the comfort level and safety level? Are we going to do the same practice? And that's my concern. I feel like what we're doing now with these small cohorts are what we're going to do when we get that green light to bring our kids back. And that concerns me. I, I know, I feel like we need to be ready sooner than later. Yeah, I, I, I do think, Mr. Han, it's just, it's too early for us to think five, six, seven weeks down the road, what, if and when we, we do get the green light from the county to bring back students in our blended model. Um, you know, we, and we have told, told folks, you know, we're, we're, we're going to, you know, it might be a week. I mean, but but we need to we need to try it out with these uh, smaller groups, and I think we're going to learn a lot. And 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 from what I've read and and seen and talked to, um, whether it's uh, districts, uh, there, there's a district I spoke with the superintendent today. They have uh, about 450 kids that they've been bringing back every day as part of their um, early childhood program since July. And they've had no issues uh, distancing and, and childcare and, 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 and the like. Um, they also have teachers teaching from their classrooms as we, we do. And, 
And as you know, when we walk into a Y classroom here on campus, there's teachers on the same campus teaching those students that are on in, in, in a room uh, via Zoom or, or, or Google mm -hmm. Meet. And so, um, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll learn a lot, from not just the work we do, but what we are seeing in other districts uh, and, and how they're transitioning. Um, I will say in the South Bay that, that, that we are one of the leaders uh, when, when talking about whether it's the athletics or the learning cohorts and, or, or some of the other things. And so, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that, that we're, um, you know, doing things right to begin because, uh, again, I, I do think we will be able to transition more quickly and, and um, help people, uh, our, especially our, our employees, uh, through that process to, to um, give them the confidence that, that we um, are collaborative here, that we have thought through and, and we're, we're communicating with them on the process for, uh, for, for their safety and, and that of the students and the families. Okay. Um, thank you for all those comments and considerations. Um, I actually had two questions. One had to do with sanitizing and disinfecting equipment, and I don't want to address that tonight, but I'd be interested to hear what the conversation has been about that in terms of bringing sports back to campus and utilizing the equipment. Um, but secondly, and more importantly, the, the question I had was, so if we start bringing school-sponsored uh, sports groups back, is that going to be voluntary? Can a coach choose whether to come back and to bring his, his students back? or will it be required for the coaches? And similarly, will it be required then that students participate if it is available or can they opt out? Uh, yes, the answer is, is yes, they can opt out. Um, in fact, we even have a, a situation uh, that was shared with one of the schools uh, early on in our discussions about, um, I believe it was a soccer coach who indicated that um, at least at the varsity level, the, the, at the team, we're all participating in some form of club and practicing. Um, I think what the coach said was they're getting every bit the amount of soccer they need right now. I'm going to remain in contact with them using the virtual means via Zoom and team meetings and, and those ty types of things um, instead. Um, but we certainly know we'll have uh, some athletes who um, just as a family decision, it's not the time for them. Um, they're not going to be penalized for that. This is an opportunity to bring those back who are comfortable and ready. Um, and that includes coaches. And so we're, we're having those discussions with them as well uh, to make sure that they, as, as the individual leader, are ready and comfortable uh, on their own right to be out there um, with, with people in person. Okay, thank you for that. And actually a similar question about special ed, Dr. Crumpy, that the special ed folks are it's not won't be mandatory that they come back, but that it will be a voluntary process for both the assessment and or uh, the special uh, cohorts or treatments that uh, they might be brought to back to campus for. Yeah, exactly. If parents are are um, we're offering it's not school because school's not been reopened. We're we're offering their their DIS services, their their speech and their OT and their APE right. and all, all those services. And so if they choose do not to not come back i mean that that um we're documenting that but that that's our offer um to try to to try to help the kids that have not been able to access um all of the services that they need to the um um to the greatest ability until that we can see them in person so they, they absolutely have that and if they if they don't want to come for the assessment i mean that's um again it's it's our it's our timeline um, that that uh, I, I mean I'll, I'll look into the, the the legal specifications of whether they the, 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 but uh, but usually parents own this if, if they want to stall the, the timeline but we've you know we've offered that that assessment and lastly our foster and homeless youth I've actually heard from some that that are really excited about actually having some resources to be able to utilize because they just don't have them elsewhere correct correct. Okay. All right, thank you. So we do have a motion and a second to approve the revised resolution of the Board of Education of the Torrance Unified School District approving ongoing actions to respond effectively to the impact of COVID-19 on district schools through the 2021 school year. Anybody else speak now or forever holding the peace? Okay, let's vote. Um, all those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. All right, motion carried, so that is approved. And that takes us to the consent agenda. Mr. Lee's favorite spot. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve 319 inclusive. Okay, is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second to approve all general functions consent items from 13 through 19 inclusive. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the consent calendar agenda is passed. Uh, we, the next item is our board calendar in the information section. There's um, interesting items there for you to look at and see. Many of them are still somewhat tentative and, and uncertain at this point since uh, what we're doing in many of our schools and in many of our departments is quite uncertain still. Uh, but that moves us on to section 21, which is comments from members of the Board of Education. And our board representative to the SoCal Rock Occupational Center. Uh, Mr. Hahn, do you have a report? Uh, just, well, today is first day of school for fall semester. Oh. Uh, today is the first day for fall semester. Uh, they have about 70 students, kids signed up for classes. On campus? No, online. Uh, but we still have the essential classes that are able to meet classes. Uh, but other than that, that is pretty much it for the report. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, are there comments from other members of the board at this point? Um, Anybody have anything? Dr. Gerson? Two things. So there mm -hmm. was, a, I guess we, oh, <laughs> based on one of the resolutions, want to wish all of the administrators happy administrator week and thank them for all of their hard work and um, hours beyond, uh, beyond clocked in time that, that they've had to put in. So thank you for that. And, um, Happy New Year to all of our Jewish staff and, and students. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just a quick comment for me. Mr. Hahn. Uh, I agree with Dr. Gerson. Um, happy Administrator Week for everyone, uh, for all the administrators there. I know it's been hard, but we appreciate all that you do. Uh, just a comment for uh, Gil. Um, just a question and just to think about. Uh, so recently, two districts got hacked with ransomware, um, one in New Hall, one in Lancaster. And so it made me think and to think about our data. And so I don't know what uh, our protocols are. And the reason why this is personal for me is because one of the schools that got hacked is a dear friend of ours family. Uh, with their, their kid's not going to school right now for the past week. Um, and so it's just maybe we talking to them, maybe think about, man, we got to make sure that our security um, technology wise and data wise is secure. So just a thought out there, you know, uh, just do your, uh, whatever we can just to secure all of our data and make sure that we have backups too. Yeah, I, uh, I get that news pretty quickly among my, my peers. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those, did you see that? It's one of the things that keeps us all up at, at night that we don't want to be that one. Um, but we have quite a few things in place and we've invested quite a lot in our security a lot of the ransomware happens because of uh, email clicks. Uh, I don't know if you recall, uh, we put in Mimecast last year yeah. to reroute all of our links in our email so that it's scrubbed and, and looked at. Uh, slight inconvenience because it takes a while for your page to come up, but it's, a, I think, a small price to pay to make sure that we're not rerouted to uh, a malformed website or a link. Um, Nothing's 100%, so uh, we also depend on the vigilance of our own employees in checking uh, headers, making sure that that really is the person that uh, uh, is talking to them via email. So we're trying our best. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, good reminder. Anybody else? Um, yes. Mrs. Liu, uh-huh. I share the same feelings. Um, thank you all administrators very much for all that you've done. Um, just want a quick note to our superintendent, Dr. Stowe, good luck on your first uh, state of education next Wednesday. And since it's gonna be virtual, I encourage everyone to come watch it. It'd be a lot easier. You don't have to drive over to the meeting room to, to see how superintendent speaks. So <laughs> I'll see you there. Yep, 
So will I. Um, and Mr. Lee, did you have a, a, anything to add at this point before we finish the meeting? Tacos. Tacos. <laughs> okay. Well, before we go to tacos, um, I want to tell you folks that the week of the school administrator we've all been alluding to is October 11th through the 17th. So please uh, give your uh, administrator a pat on the back and thank them for all of the time and effort they've put in and try to help them um, as they help you. So we can all be in this together. Um, I did have a couple of things from our last agenda that I did not take a moment to uh, recognize. One was that September 15th to October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, so I want uh, all of us to um, honor our Hispanic uh, students and uh, the contributions that they have made to uh, our school district as well as the historical contributions thereof. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then I have some anniversary increments that I don't wanna forget. Uh, our 10 year anniversary increment for Glenda Simpson and then 15 year anniversaries for uh, Ronald Hopkins, Rhonda Ishida, Julian Kiesing Cookson, Maggie Capellian, sorry, Elizabeth McQueen, Kathleen Medlock, Jonathan Mercado, Mandy Nicholson, Marina Ojeda, and Veronica Riley. Uh, thank you folks for working with our schools and uh, sticking with us and, and keeping them running smoothly and, and uh, all of the things that you do for our students and our schools. And with that said, I'm ready to uh, entertain a uh, motion for adjournment and tacos. Oh, sorry. So moved. <laughs> <We're adjourned. laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thanks, folks, for being with us this evening. Right and on. for those of you uh, participants that are still with us, please do check out the new procedure for uh, um, having your comments at our board meetings. We have made an attempt to make it a live uh, comment section as you've seen this evening. So I hope you will take advantage of that and let us hear from you. And with that said, thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.